Good afternoon from beautiful Barcelona. I am Alexis Rod, CEO of SciTech Diplo Hub, the Barcelona Science and Technology Diplomacy Hub. Thank you so much for joining one more week at our SciTech Talks, the series of weekly free online lectures that SciTech Diplo Hub and eBay have put forward together with other world-class institutions and leading international experts in science diplomacy and global affairs. Last week, we discussed the global governance and bioethical implications of human genome editing and the role of science diplomacy. Today, we will delve into the role of science diplomacy in the global south and its main challenges and opportunities. Crucial issues in developing countries, economic growth, sustainable development, agriculture, talent retention, are underpinned by science and technology development. As such, science diplomacy takes on a very special role. First, to increase their influence and input into global issues, and second, to build connective links with other nations. In the Global South, science diplomacy has been the basis for the generation of research centers, bilateral projects, uh, mobility programs for scientists, and capacity building actions in science, technology, and innovation. Panama, for example, developed in 2018 a science diplomacy strategy with the leadership of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And other countries in the region, such as Brazil, Mexico, and Cuba, have also implemented their own policies. In a similar way, uh, there are increasingly relevant initiatives on science diplomacy that have been developed in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia with the aim of improving scientific capacity and participation in international scientific projects. Overall, as developing countries begin to embrace science diplomacy, a new perspective is emerging that reflects the South's different history, diverse strength, and unique needs. But how does the Global South, uh, as a whole, approach science diplomacy? Why is science diplomacy particularly important in regions like Africa and Latin America? How can countries in the region make use of science and technology to advance towards the SDGs? How can science support political, social, and economic development in countries characterized by a conflict-prone status and vulnerability to negative geopolitical trends? To answer to some of these questions, today we are thrilled to welcome four world-class experts in science diplomacy, development, and international relations, who will be moderated by Anna Ayuso, senior researcher at CDOC and adjunct faculty at PBA. Good afternoon, Anna. The floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation uh, to participate in this interesting session on uh, science diplomacy in the Global South in this uh, challenging time of uh, multidimensional crisis. Uh, when the effects of the COVID uh, pandemic crisis in development countries are still difficult to fully assess, uh, not only in the economic terms, but also in social consequences. So uh, I think that science diplomacy has an important role to play in address these common challenges and identify the main ways to collaborate between different regions, uh, sharing different perspectives and building links between uh, nations. So science, science diplomacy will help also to reflect the South different history and perspectives and the different needs that emerging countries have. So in this session, the objectives are first to debate about why is science diplomacy important in uh, regions of the South like Africa and Latin America? And secondly, how can science support political, social, and economic development in countries with high vulnerabilities uh, to negative geopolitical trends in the, in the current context? So to address that, as uh, Alexis said, uh, we have four excellent speakers, and I'll briefly introduce them right now. Uh, first one is Kimberly Portness. Uh, she is uh, uh, actually in Science and Technology Policy Fellowship Coordinator at the Inter-American Institute for Global Ch Change Research and a June faculty at the Institute for Scientific Research and Advanced Technology Services in Panama. We have also Raibon Sader. He's the director of the Center for Socioeconomic Development uh, in Geneva and professor uh, in organization and international management at the University of uh, Basel. Hello. Uh, Brita Renkam is a senior research in the Energy, Environment and Climate Change Group and senior fellow at the African Climate and Development Initiative at the University of Cape Town. 
And finally, we have also Ayman Karar, advisor to the Minister of Irrigation and Water Resources of Sudan and senior advisor at the United, United Nations Environment Programme. So we will start uh, with the first round of uh, questions uh, for each one. Uh, we will have five minutes to address these questions only, so I will tell you when you are in the last minute. Uh, try to be uh, short and, uh, and clear. And, uh, well, uh, I will start, and, and I can. I want to say to the audience that they can, in, in during all the 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 session, can do the questions uh, uh, in the chat of the of the pa the, in the panel this is, uh, in, in the side of the the the, 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 the screen. So uh, we will uh, follow at the end uh, of the the first uh, questions. At the end of the session, we will take this, uh, these uh, questions. So let's start with Kimberly Formas. Uh, Kimberly, Latin America countries have a long tradition on bilateral, regional, and global scientific cooperation and as an essential tool to complement the national capacities for research, technological development, and innovation. Uh, do, well, how do you think that uh, this science diplomacy evolved in recent years in, in the region? And how can it help address the main challenges that exist in the region, especially in the pandemic and post-pandemic scenario? Kimberly? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Anna, for that excellent question. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning, this afternoon. Um, and I'm excited to have a discussion with this incredible panel of diverse global representation here. Thank you. So I would say that in recent years, specifically pre-COVID at least, we have seen a concerted evolution of science diplomacy in Latin America. Here I draw on an excellent survey done this, just this year by UNESCO, CILAC, on the science diplomacy strategies, initiatives, and mechanisms in the region. Uh, Lexi's touched on a few of those in his intro. Uh, Argentina, for example, trains their diplomats in the Argentine scientific system to establish international ties and attract investments in the field of bioeconomy, particularly with the European Union. Brazil, as part of a strategy to increase global industrial competitiveness, has a Department of Science and Technology in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and an innovation diplomacy program implemented at the federal and subnational level. Colombia is in the process of passing a national science diplomacy strategy, which would articulate with neighboring countries, including Panama. And I must highlight, as Alexis did in his intro, Panama being my second home country was the first country in Latin America to adopt a national science diplomacy strategy. These strategies help create the vision and framework for interaction between the diplomatic core and the science scientific community. They all are trying to seek mechanisms to solve global problems and align with the SDGs and the 2030 agenda. Now, the story of the II, the Inter-American um, Institute for Global Change Research, is actually an excellent example of the tradition and evolution of science diplomacy, but from a regional perspective. We often say that science diplomacy is in the bones of II, which was born as a North-South Scientific Collaboration Network. Back in 1992, with the signing of international agreements like the Convention of Biological Diversity, the science advisor of the US president at the time, George H.W. Bush, suggested the creation of an intergovernmental um, organization to focus on global change issues and connect the region. Consolidated that same year under the Declaration of Montevideo, the IAI today has 19 member countries from Canada and the US to Argentina and Chile involved in defining an evolving scientific agenda together with leading experts in climate change and variability, biodiversity and ecosystem services, human health and well-being, energy, water and food security, among others. Through these past decades, the II has supported and financed collaborative research networks, which we call CRNs, 
involving over 100 researchers in 90 institutions across 15 of our member countries to address global change phenomena through a transdisciplinary approach. This is coupled with an extensive training program, not only for scientists, but also for decision makers and their government agencies throughout the design and implementation of projects to encourage dialogue, trust, and collaboration among very diverse stakeholders. And I would say that beyond the challenges posed by global change, the region, Latin America, also faces challenges of political instability, budgetary problems, institutional corruption, or bureaucratic barriers for STEM professionals to even enter a diplomatic career. In smaller countries, we simply do not have enough researchers to pull from to do the hard work of building effective science diplomacy mechanisms. So despite these positive advances in the region towards science diplomacy, the biggest challenge is the systematization or the institutionalization of science diplomacy. For example, science advisors and attaches in embassies and working with foreign ministers. But there is a lack of capacity building to train and support these future science advisors in the region. So the II just this past year started a science technology and policy fellowship program which is modeled after the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancements of Science program. And we see this as a crucial pipeline for creating these science advisors in our region, placing early career researchers in private or public host institutions to engage with decision makers and work on issues of uh, national priority. In addition to the step fellow work plans, which is defined by each host institution, the IAI provides a professional development program, which is a complementary training experience across the three pillars of science, diplomacy, leadership, and communication, all through the unique cultural lens of Latin America and the Caribbean. Our first generation of step fellows from Mexico, Argentina, Peru, have joined with fellows from MITEX Canada and the AAAS in a joint science diplomacy training program led by someone I think a few of you know here, Dr. Marga Gual. Last uh, <laughs> This truly inter-American group of 20 fellows is not just training together, but also working on um, group science diplomacy projects in areas like science and security and diplomacy in the climate fragile polar regions, clean energy, circular economy, sustainable agriculture, and the food, water, energy nexus, and sharing data at the global health, global change nexus. We see these fellows as potential agents of change in their countries, strengthening their knowledge and skills to use science diplomacy from IAI's well-established regional network to take on some pretty incredible transboundary challenges. And we really look forward to seeing what these fellows will accomplish in the years to come. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, now we changed, we moved to Africa with uh, Brita Rentkamp. Um, Brita, uh, African leaders have widely recognized that science and technology should be the, at the top uh, development priority in the region. In fact, the, the African Union countries have endorsed a funding target of one person of each country's GDP on research and development. Uh, that is uh, half of the average in Europe, but it's just uh, a, a good, uh, a good uh, world. Uh, but um, today, um, it's true that almost every national, regional, and continental policy documents and a strategy development plans has science, technology, and innovation as a higher pr priority. But um, which are the opportunities that uh, science diplomacy offers to Africa and its social uh, and, uh, and economic prospects? And can you tell us uh, which are some of the most promising mechanisms and strategies that currently are under development? Yes, thank you very much. With a lot of pleasure, Anna. Thank you for the question. Um, so I just want to make three points in terms of answering your question. Um, so firstly, I just want to highlight the role of science uh, diplomacy in terms of being very critical for the uh, for Africa in order to meet its future developmental needs. 
I come with a bias um, from a climate um, development perspective, and I just want to highlight a few points that um, probably many of you are familiar with, um, but some of you might not, in terms of where we are in, Af in Africa on the continent at the moment and where we're moving. So just to remind you, um, Africa counts as the most vulnerable region to climate change. So it's the region on the world that will is most likely suffer most from the impact. In terms of its livelihood of its people who live here, it's about 70% um, of adult livelihoods rely on agricultural impact uh, on agricultural activities so that in combination with high climate impacts means um, that um, these livelihoods will change and there's there's um, likelihood that this might go for the negative and um, so there is migration to the cities um, there's a lot of urban growth and urbanization their estimates uh, that about two thirds of all Africans in by 2050 um, will have will live in cities, and um, that's also where most of the jobs will be. Um, so that is all of that, along with the democrat uh, demographic changes. So the estimates say it's about two billion people living on the continent by 2050, and that aligns with the. Um, with the goals for carbon neutrality as well. So there's a lot of big challenges that need to be met in a quite short period of time. And there's an, a big need for planning. Now, this could go in two directions. So it could go um, driving towards um, technological change, towards knowledge driven economies. Um, and that's where science diplomacy comes in, because that is basically what you need. You want to create um, cities that um, that make use of new and innovative technologies so that livelihoods will earn high incomes and will be safe and secure um, and not go the, uh, down the opposite road, which might be um, big African urban spaces that um, that basically um, translate into growing slum conditions which are very which make people very vulnerable so now the key thing is here that Africa is a young continent so most people here um, is looking in a grow like an age pyramid that is the opposite of of Europe um, they are um, few, much fewer elderly and much more young people, but only about 10% are enrolled in higher education programs at the moment. So it's, uh, and that's moving forward is basically, in my view, the biggest challenge for, um, for science and um, science diplomacy in order to work with the universities, um, create the researchers who can understand these challenges and manage them in knowledge driven economies, in knowledge based um, governance, uh, create policy policies that are based on evidence. So in terms of what we see in mechanisms, is a lot of progress. So we have um, the NDC processes for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. We have the conditionalities that come with that. Um, we have the climate uh, technology mechanism. Um, we have the Africa Group. We have the Agenda 2063 for reformed um, Africa and all of that. So there's a lot of multilateral, um, open and transparent ambition. There's an updated EU, AU strategy that also built on greed and growth and all of that. But that is only one side of the coin, which is the open multi multilateral and transparent networks that are there. And a lot of the policies that you've mentioned, the targets for R&D investment, all of that kind of like go up that route. Now there's the flip side of that coin are like cl more close than bilateral um, relationships where there's not much coordination in the science diplomacy that happens. So there are many countries that do their own deals. Um, they're closed networks that aren't really transparent. And then often in terms of countries with small GDPs in countries with um, small own capital, they come in deals that can then overwhelm a country. And we've seen, um, for example, as part of the Chinese um, um, Belt and Road Initiative, not wanting to put the Chinese on the spot here, 
Um, but they've got um, 43 bilateral agreements um, out of 54 nations in, can in, um, in Africa. And often these then are um, negotiated bilaterally as opposed to negotiating through the AU and to a co coordinated um, approach. And the same counts for SADC, for the Southern African region. So um, often countries find themselves in 101 negotiations without a multilateral um, concerted approach. So we've seen uh, also in terms of impact of COVID now, we've seen the default of Zambia already. Um, so there is a risk of growing stranded assets. Um, there is, There are about 25 new coal plants on the horizon here. And there is the question of like, how can Africa, in terms of addressing its climate and development, um, challenges leapfrog rather than um, Last minute. traditional pathways yes so i think the 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 best bet for science and diplomacy um is really to grow africa and its future students closer to the rest of the world fund african programs well for joint and decolonized research because a lot of the research funds and capacity centers in the global north so that you train the scientists and graduates that we actually need to manage all these infrastructural needs for the future and that you actually um, build knowledge-driven economies and sustainable livable African cities. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Um, sorry for being so sharp <laughs> but i uh, we have to follow the, the the time so now we change to to raymond sanner to talk about the global agenda mm, the COVID pandemic has on the one hand opened uh the floor a new multi-stakeholder uh, scenario but on the other hand we have the sustainable development goals framework that um, represent uh, a fundamental shift uh, in the objectives and motivations of science diplomacy in the international agenda. So how do you think that countries in the global south uh, can make better use of science and technology to advance towards this uh, SDG agenda? Uh, and what is the role of uh, not only the state, but also the non-state stakeholders, such as the private enterprises or the scientific organizations in, 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 the, in achieving these goals. Please, Raymond. Okay. Thank you, Anna, for a, a very uh, big question. I hope I can live up to uh, provide you with some of the answers. Um, just to start with, though, allow me to make a few comments about just definitional issues. Um, you know, I, I teach a lot on diplomacy and negotiations, um, and there are people who are quite uh, strongly still, uh, fe they feel upset about if diplomacy is mixed or used uh, with other uh, specialties or specializations such as science. So just to say, you know, when it goes back to the traditional forms of diplomacy, that's covered by the Vienna Convention that goes back to 1961, which defines the rights and obligations for states when they engage in diplomatic relations. That's state to state. Then came, the in the 70s, the progressive uh, participation of line ministries in state to state diplomacy. So you had maybe, for instance, uh, when it comes to health, you had the Ministry of Health. They will go to Geneva for the World Health Organization's annual meetings or other uh, seminars or, or meetings to, to discuss health. And of course, they were accompanied by their colleagues from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So there was a, an increasing mixing of line ministries with foreign policy officials to the foreign policy officials particularly were there and still are there to make sure that overall the country's overall policies and strategies are uh, respected and are part of a global understanding from a national country perspective. Then came the next move and that's what I'm personally also uh, my publications focus on what is called the new diplomacies. 
new diplomacy in the sense it's not just state to state or the state with line ministries being part of a delegation that talks to other delegations of other countries but now there's also this mixing in of business on one side and civil society so the multi-stakeholder negotiations have on one hand become quite interesting <laughs> but at the same time it's becoming very complex you could even say at times confusing because it's not quite clear who signs an agreement if there is ever going to be an agreement because if it's international of course the states are still in the lead but domestically and sometimes when there are uh, SDG related um, uh, discussions the other multi-stakeholders who are called the major groups and the other stakeholder groups and one of the major groups is science and technology so science and technology gets involved in the SDGs and has been for since 1992 uh, but just to, to clarify so when we talk about science diplomacy it could be the traditional state to state and then it could be bilateral plurilateral multilateral or even multi-institutional but it's still an affair of states versus then the new diplomacies where uh, business uh, representatives of industry as well as of society participate now to take the example of the COVID pandemic. Uh, here in uh, Geneva, as you probably f follow this on and off, there are lots of meetings. When the pandemic became really a, a disastrous pandemic last year, the issue came up you know, what to do, how to uh, diagnose, analyze, treat. And now, of course, mostly is the vaccines. Who should provide vaccines to uh, help people in the north in the south in other countries to be more immune towards the infection caused by the uh, pandemic uh, the virus now that is in itself a very interesting and also complicated uh, process because at the world health organization which is health science also that still states only states meet agree discuss then you go to the World Trade Organization, where they're discussing about the waiver for the uh, TRIPS, the trade-related uh, intellectual property agreements, and to allow the least developed countries, for instance, and some of the developing countries, to not have to respect the obligation of honoring patents. And in the pharmaceutical industry, of course, that's the big pharmaceutical companies in the north who have produced the vaccines that we are uh, being able to use in in the north and now it's a discussion about how to make how to provide that also for the rest of the world but to provide this for the rest of the world is a complicated negotiation with the pharmaceutical companies who have the know-how produce vaccines and require on request of course that the patents they hold should be honored and that they also in that sense make a profit now <clears throat> we already had the problem during the AIDS uh, period where uh, people in the south just couldn't pay uh, the uh, uh, medication that was on offer and they had the, the first meeting in South Africa to find a, nego a negotiated outcome with the pharmaceutical companies we have the same now in uh, another group here in Geneva, COVAX, where countries, especially developed countries, make some money available, some vaccines, also a few million doses, to help in the South, to help people to also reach a certain minimum immunity uh, to face the uh, um, uh, virus. However, that's, uh, again, a negotiation with patent holders, that's business, it's a negotiation with countries to make available uh, money to pay, to pay for, the, for these uh, um, uh, vaccines. And finally, mm -hmm. it's also an issue about technology transfer. Last minute. Yeah, it, it's a technology transfer, which would mean 
to produce, manufacture the um, vaccines in the South rather than to go through the, uh, the existing process, which is quite costly, to produce vaccines in the North. How to then set up a manufacturing capability in the South and to provide patents and to provide the know-how for manufacturing processes, that's at the moment all being negotiated. I've uh, concluded. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, of course, today all the G7 are discussing all these things uh, at this moment, probably. Uh, so we go to the last uh, panelist and then we can discuss all together of, about all these interesting questions. Um, Eamon Karar, uh, you, you are expert in water governance. Uh, really, many of the water systems of the world are shared by more than two countries and uh, uh, sometimes uh, a lot of, of countries uh, could be aquifers, lakes, rivers, seas and open oceans. Uh, all these uh, shared resources are linked by a complex web of uh, environmental, political, economic and security interdependence. Uh, what is the role of science diplomacy in this transboundary water management? And um, how can science contribute uh, to the, mobil the mobilization for joint action and uh, trust building uh, between uh, the countries and, uh, and uh, the water cooperation? Great. Um, thank you so much, Anna. And at the beginning, I just want to thank um, to thank the Institute for this uh, interesting opportunity for me to share some some reflections i would i would say and thank you for a very good question i think it's encompassing quite encompassing but the focus here is on on the on the water as a resource a common pool resource that is shared between within a country between users between um, um, levels of uh, of governance administrative boundaries as well as between countries and this can be surface water can be groundwater as you rightfully said. So in my talk, I want to focus on three aspects. I want to uh, characterize them, uh, identify the challenges, as well as give some suggestions on, on the future. Um, obviously, the role of science technology is well known in transboundary cooperation. We heard it. Um, the reasons being is that many of the water systems are shared so 64% of the Africa surface area is um, shared water. So um, talking about um, uh, complexity, that these resources are linked by complex web of disciplines, as you said, environmental, political, economic and security interdependencies within nations and across boundaries. So we have complexity, we have the, the, the need for the transdisciplinarity, as well as the water management and talking about SDG um, 6.5 in this instance. So complexity of water governance can be the main reason, in my view, uh, behind the limited success of sustainable development in translating, uh, translating it into real cooperation. Now, complexity is attributed to a number of factors. I mean, we heard about climate change, um, the change um, is, a, is, is a central word here, increase in temperature affecting amounts and distribution of rainfall, as well as the interseasonal variability, you have peaks of droughts, peaks of floods. Apart from that, the imperfect science that we have in estimating availability of water and projecting demand because of the changes in population, urbanization, migration, food preferences, and so on. So the challenge here when we're dealing with complexity is the lack of adequate data and lack of cooperation in data sharing. Uh, water is a highly security issue, and I think the sharing is, is so limited because of that fear. The other is that the equity of ability to generate water intelligence from the data. And here, this is about future scenarios and systems science analyses for um, a common resource like, uh, like water. The digital divide is another barrier or challenge 
uh, depending on the socioeconomic level of development. I mean, you said that there is investment of um, one one percent of G GDP in Africa and so on. I don't think m most of the countries haven't reached that level even. So the limited funding of research, the pledge to contribute uh, this uh, one percent is, I don't, in my view, I don't think it, it has materialized. I haven't come across um, a reference to, to quote. Now I go to transdisciplinarity. The cross-cutting nature of water requires a combination of many disciplines, the hydrology, hydrology, climatology, geomorphology, etc. But then bringing on the social, political, legal sciences. Now the challenge is that most of the transboundary engagements um, and talks and negotiations around water are technically focused and lack the adequate research around the regional history, social eco economy and environmental drivers and constraints. The main uh, government administration leading the negotiations is mostly the water ministry, which is mostly technical with engagements from foreign affairs ministry and others. Now, so the framing of the issues that are mainly uh, technical um, gives the focus in, in the wrong uh, direction. Obviously, you all know about the Nile. Now, the Nile is focusing on the, on the negotiations and so on, and it, they got into a, a, a tight spot on the operations of the dam across the countries and the time for filling. Whilst we have occupied land, um, allegedly by Ethiopian troops and so on, um, because of the, of the, of the, of the socioeconomic development. So here you can see where, where we're focusing, but then the analysis, the intelligence of a broader uh, understanding is not there. The domestic management arrangements is the third aspect. And I submit that if a country properly manages its water resources, i.e. they are implementing their SDG 6.5 of IWRM and decentralization and so on, uh, the monitoring, the assessments, the allocation, the integration between the various levels of governance would be done well then cooperation across the border can be easier because they have clear plans and it's easier to build trust when you know what you have and you want to share that. And the actors involved are broad enough and I'm glad to hear from Raymond that we are going into this uh, new diplomacies uh, between uh, engaging with the local users, the private sector, academia, NGO, media, um, they all, the, the level of awareness will be quite high. Now, what are the challenges for in this instance that many countries lag behind in the implementation of this 6.5? Sudan has got some examples of community-based management, which has now become a strategy, and also for the um, state water councils that are established in various states for coordinating the use of the resource. But I can't say that um, there, is, uh, there is more. Now, how, what are the opportunities for science diplomacy to contribute to mobilizing for joint action and trust building and water cooperation, as you were asking, is that one is smart multi-nation capacity building and investments in research. I have an example of the Nile Basin Initiative. This is an excellent initiative. It has been going on since 19, um, since more than now, it's almost 20 years, and it has created good partnerships. And as, um, as Kimberly said, institutionalize the partnerships. However, I think maybe the criticism is that the funding is coming from elsewhere. Now, if the countries um, um, contribute to this uh, partnerships, then maybe we might have uh, institutionalized it better. WaterNet is another example since 1997 in Southern Africa, where there are master programs that are given to um, through a number of institutions in various countries in SEDEC. And, and this is, again, producing the young graduates that will allow for science diplomacy in the future. I want to speak about Warsaw, but I think the, the, the time. Uh, open science platforms for sharing data and publications, absolutely critical for South-North uh, collaborations, but also across the South uh, for joint publications and so on. And also, I think the training in system science is lacking in the when we handle water and it's with the complexity it's becoming absolutely crucial so i'll stop here maybe we'll take some questions thank you very much thank you 
Uh, well, we we have a lot of questions, so I think I will I will try to do uh, a resume of uh, of the the questions. You can see them also, but uh, uh, but I will try to to resume, and uh, you we will do a last round. Uh, fa five minutes each one to to answer the, the all the questions well uh, i have uh, some questions about um how how to in empower the south uh in uh, science diplomacy in terms of uh, being more influent in terms of access to training of uh, of uh, diplo uh, of uh, diplomats and science uh, diplomacy uh, also, we have questions about regional integration um, uh, for Brita about uh, 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 and, and see, yes for Brita and for Kim also uh, uh, about the the instability and how that affects to scientific uh, cooperation. Um, we have also questions about how how um, improve the collaboration between the global south and the no and the global north uh, in in scientific uh, uh, diplomacy cooperation and uh, also one question that is uh, it's how to engage lawmakers and in general also with uh, decision makers uh, to to cooperate uh, in in science in, in science, and also that we have uh, uh, some questions about the the, the COVID nineteen vaccine and which uh, are the the initiatives. Maybe Raymond can tell something more about what is uh, now and um, being negotiated. Um, and. Uh, uh, I see uh, also, uh, no, this is the, I think, yeah, already said. Uh, um, yeah, also, the question of resources, uh, how, how to have more resources to be devoted, especially with the, the, the less developed uh, countries that don't have the, uh, the, the, the resources to, to dedicate to, to the, the science of, uh, and development investment. And, uh, and also the decolonization question, how to decolonize uh, the signs uh, to, to be less dependent of the North uh, uh, patterns. I think this, uh, this is more or less uh, the questions that are in the, in the panel. I have a last question also for everybody is, uh, what have we learned from the last, uh, a year about uh, the cooperation and the lacks of cooperation, how to improve the scientific cooperation, especially in crises like this, but, but in general, and how to prevent uh, this, this crisis and how to be more and more able to do a, a, a response uh, to this, uh, to this a reaction to this uh, situation. So now you have also five minutes, it's, it's one, to, to you, we can choose. You don't need to answer all the questions, but uh, what do you prefer? And uh, we start in the same in the same order. So now, Kimberly, please. Great, thank you, Anna. Luckily, I think uh, I was planning on touching on some of these issues. So hopefully, um, I'm able able to answer your questions. And if not. Um, I'm sure Lexis can share our contact information um, and, and I'd be happy to, to fill in in the chat as well. I do think that the pandemic has revealed that we have a long way to go to fully integrate our scientific community with diplomacy and decision making. Um, I would argue that's the case in every country, um, but Latin America has been particularly vulnerable because we don't have a tradition yet of evidence-based decision making. Um, that was one small cause for celebration during the pandemic was to hear on mainstream media for the first time the term decisiones basadas en evidencia. Um, as Raymond pointed out, we are watching vaccine diplomacy play out in our region with differing strategies in each of our countries aligning with vaccine producing or donor countries like Russia, China, US, and Europe. 
uh, which will be very interesting to see how the long-term effects play out on international north-south geopolitical relations. Um, the countries like Costa Rica and Panama had pre-existing international agreements with US universities and government institutions like the CDC to build public health infrastructure to work on Zika, Dengue, which allowed us to quickly pivot to work on the COVID-19 response. Um, Cuba, for example, has mobilized for decades international outreach in biotech and medical um, outreach, which was also helpful during the pandemic. But at the decision-making and international relations level, the region has depended largely on ad hoc mechanisms. And I would argue with too much dependence on experts in epidemiology, when we need multidisciplinary task forces with experts in social sciences, education, logistics, political science and economics to be working on the issues that our countries are facing. Um, another lesson learned is that strong international scientific collaboration needs to be institutionalized, as we've mentioned a couple of times here. This is an investment and a cultural shift. Uh, it makes capacity building so important because we ha can have a multiplying effect for a relatively low cost. Um, beyond seminars and workshops, the region needs more meaningful experiential learning opportunities like fellowship programs, which are common in industrialized nations. Uh, diverse stakeholders are using our joint science diplomacy training program to strengthen their own international networks and support an emerging science diplomacy ecosystem in the region. In addition to II strategic partnership agreements with organizations like the AAAS, MyTax Canada, INCSA, and Future Earth, our STEP team is in ongoing discussions to identify program champions, potential hosts, financial supporters, technical experts from the region, including One minute. the, thank you, NSERC in Canada, uh, the USGCRP in the US, the Global Young Academy, um, Eat Best. In Peru, we're talking to the US Embassy and the Fulbright Program. And in Chile, we're talking to the Parliamentary Technical Advisory Office, part of the Chilean National Library of Congress, to establish a training mechanism for effective policy brief writing. All this to say that fellowship programs can be a powerful platform to capitalize on these synergies north-south and south-south with the goal of empowering individuals and institutions to establish in every country these permanent mechanisms that we need at this time and to stop the pandemic and look towards future crises. And finally, I do want to mention that the pandemic has forced us to reevaluate what kind of skills are needed in particular for early career researchers to be successful professionals and why not knowledge brokers in science diplomacy. The transdisciplinary approach to science is a harder road. It takes more time and resources to make science participatory, inclusive, solution-based, innovative, to co-design our projects with decision makers and community members, which touches on some of the questions we're seeing in the chat. Our training program is looking to build a curriculum that focuses on the development of what we call power skills. Empathy, listening, cultural relevance, and reflection for effective communication with non-experts. We've all learned how important flexibility is during the pandemic, and we need our experts to hone these skills in negotiation, conflict resolution, and consultation and accompany them with mentors and best practices that fit the context of our region. And I think that makes for a more enriching experience for everyone. Um, I'll leave it at that and, and let the rest of the panelists try and take on some of these great questions. Thank you, everyone. So, Brita, please, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for the questions. Um, I need to pick and choose, um, so I'm going to touch on three points. Um, so also just to mention the pandemic has also brought out interesting points um, in, uh, in the African continent. And also actually, um, as opposed to what Kim just mentioned, there was a lot of science and policy interface actually. Lockdowns happened very quickly. Um, local science, you know, especially in the medical area came out um, quickly. Um, and there's a lot of integration in that sector um, due to previous pandemics and the way that they've man been managed. Um, so. 
that has been surfaced up. But now if you look in the other direction in terms of how then um, trades and com commodities flow, how the vaccine rollout is happening, how, you know, um, there's like manufacturing for vaccines being rolled out, but all delayed and the global capital on the invasion rents and all of that for the vaccine is in the global south, uh, so in the global north, um, sorry. So in a way, we can still see how a lot of this um, north-south divide actually plays out despite good signs in the global south and particularly in health in Africa. Um, then I also want to touch on the way that it's um, administered is still in the way that the funds get our hold in the global north. Often there's people visiting, but we are often in the position that we're the data collectors and so forth. So there needs to be a much more equal approach to um, to um, the 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 way that the funding is administered and the way that the the partnerships work and again i think people and the youth and the students are very critical to build those bridges as kim mentioned fellowships exchanges um more of the integration across the continent there are some initiatives already on the african research university alliance for example but we struggle for funding and eh? it's um it's still very hard and now with covid uh, funding gets cut. Um, the UK has just cut their whole uh, Global Challenges Research Fund. So it, they are scrambled only, and um, you can see how what remains um, is not the 1% target. We're not there in Africa. And, and it's really hard to make things work. And for those who are capable and can actually embark on scientific um, careers, there's a lot of competition for good people in the, in the private sector, and, and they might rather go there. So these are the challenges that we're dealing with also in the day to day and doing science in africa thank you thank you so raymond can you hmm. i can but i'm at the same time reading some of the questions and i know that i have five minutes so uh, i'll i'll do the circus act of trying to cover a few things at this, as as much as i can um and i'd like to bring to our discussion a basic additional concept that we haven't yet addressed. Science and science diplomacy can be for dual purpose. We know that science could lead to uh, new um, weapons. We see this now with the uh, whole development when it comes to uh, the, the arms and weaponry that's being used in, in the current areas of conflict drones as just one example uh, so we, we should just be mindful science is not just good as such it can be used for good and less good purposes and we should bear this in mind when we negotiate agreements with other countries science is also a core element a key element for competitiveness national competitiveness i just want to say briefly you know, when it comes to the initiative at WTO uh, for the waiver for developing countries so they don't have to go by the TRIPS agreement. Now, it just so happened that it's India and South Africa together who started this initiative. Both countries, particularly India, has a powerful pharma industry based on generics. South Africa also could develop that even further. Now, it's not necessarily always such initiatives are only from a humanitarian perspective. They can be multi-purpose, and we should, in that sense, just address it and see it and make sure that the, let's say, the new initiative about the um, production of, of, of um, vaccines do not replace northern-based monopolies by southern-based monopolies. We have to keep the whole community of countries uh, um, in mind, and some of them just will not have access neither to money nor to the scientific technological ingredients it takes to produce vaccines, so they shouldn't be left out in the cold. Um, and in terms of um, the SDGs, I would highly recommend, not because I just wrote a, a book uh, on it with my three co-authors, 
but public goods are an essential good seem to bear in mind when we talk about science development capacity building sharing we should all agree public goods is essential for the survival of this planet for all of us develop developing north south east west be it water be it air uh, but also uh, when it comes to education so that to me we should put on top even of the sdgs and get people to agree we should contribute and we should share. So I think that I better stop now. <laughs> and so we have now the floor is for Elman. Um, thanks, Anna. I just want to pick up where Raymond has stopped. I think uh, the, the common pool resource, I agree fully, that is something that is much, much uh, broader, that is it can be a serious contributor changing behaviors but also enhancing cooperation um, and here we need to um, we need to emphasize in in the south countries of the south and developing countries in general that there needs to be um, active engagement of all users or citizens they have a role to play and a responsibility to play and they are science diplomats in their own right and i'm not talking about the traditional science i'm talking about the science that we need from the local indigenous um, understanding especially when we're dealing with our in the in uh, deficiencies in data long-run data we don't have we have elders who have memories of large events such as droughts and successive droughts and pe periodicity of the droughts uh, how do we integrate the two sciences is something that we really need to invest in. From the questions, I think uh, what I want to uh, pick up is the decolonization of the science. And I like that very much because I think um, science follows where the money is coming from. Um, and there is a, a strong uh, need for South-South kind of definition of research agenda regarding the various issues, the various aspects and so on, because I think telling the story, the narrative has to change um, a little bit in, 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 in some of the countries, especially when it comes to transboundary um, water cooperation in the region, because I think if it's left to the Orange River users between Namibia and South Africa or to the Takazi Atbara between Sudan and Ethiopia, those who are farming the land, they would have found a way of, of engaging and collaborating. It didn't, you know, so if, if that is a leverage to bring sanity at the top, I think that is something that we need to, to pick up and highlight and we need to bring up. The, the other is um, what I want to, the, the, something that was mentioned in the discussion also, the institutionalization and taking up good practices between the South and the South. I think the, the WaterNet is a good, the IAP, the Inter-Academies panel of the Science Academies of Africa, um, they are do doing beautiful work with the Brazil Academy and, um, and there is such, uh, such exchange that I think um, for us, it, it, it's, it, it's the defining of what are the kind of, um, the collaborations in research. The, 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 the important part is what science are we producing? The relevant science to the decision makers. Because sometimes the science is going in a one trajectory and the decision makers are doing. As, as Kim has said, we have not internalized this thing about the science decisions uh, being based on science-based. Um, this is still, we have to work on that, but the science has to be relevant to the decision maker. It has to be timelessly, it has to be in the right language. It has, there is a whole lot of, of work that we need to do in that on how the decision maker would pick up on what the scientists um, are producing. And I think in this era now with all the change and so on, the complexity especially, we need these think tanks from across regions. So I think we have to capitalize more, not only SADC on its own and EGAD on its own and LAC on its own. I think these regions have to start um, engaging and start um, creating the narrative 
that is relevant to our and, and bringing out the commonalities where the, there, is, there are more synergies um, for collaboration. Thank you very much. I'll stop here. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, I think we are on time. Uh, uh, I think we, we have we had an exciting uh, conversation and I think I give the floor to Alexis because he has to close the, the seminar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for the moderation. And thank you, team, Rita, Raymond, and Iman for this super enriching conversation. It's a pity we didn't have time for, for, for more. Uh, we still have plenty of questions to be answered. I'm sure that we will have the opportunity to follow the conversation on our social media. And thank you again for making time out of your busy calendars and also while uh, managing other work and family responsibilities. So thank you so much again. So as we saw today, science diplomacy will be an instrumental vector of social and economic development in the, in the global south. Scientific and technological capacity in Africa and Latin America is on the rise, but a proportional focus on connecting it to policy and diplomacy lacks behind uh, other regions. The dialogue between science, policy, and citizens, uh, an interesting challenge to science diplomacy, must also be consist in a multi-level logic as we were discussing today, between the global, the regional, and the national. And success will depend on the internationalization of the country's science through both public and private sector. And therefore, there is a need to identify uh, synergetic relationships with foreign partners who can address some of the domestic shortcomings. With the advantages, international relations can be created through research and innovation, and as such, they cannot be separated from the broader diplomatic and development agendas. Today, this is a special series of our study talks on the new role of science diplomacy after COVID-19 comes to an end. For the last weeks, we have discussed the role of science and technology diplomacy to tackle climate change, the opportunities for science diplomacy in the global governance of human genome editing, and how the Global South can leverage science diplomacy as we saw today. In case you miss any of the sessions, you can watch them now on our YouTube channel. Our study talks has reached a total live audience of over 1,000 people from 65 different countries. So I think that we could say that it is clear that science diplomacy, it is here to stay. Let me take this opportunity to remind you that if you would like to get certified in science diplomacy, applications for our science diplomacy summer school are still open. This unique two weeks university course to be held this July in an online format and organized by SciTech Diplo Hub and eBay together with other leading institutions will allow you to build your knowledge and skills in science diplomacy and further your career into some of the topics we have been discussing in these online lectures at the intersection of science and diplomacy, including climate change, cybersecurity, AI diplomacy, sustainable development, global health, and the study of different national and regional approaches to science diplomacy. Thank you so much uh, once again for joining us. Stay safe, and I hope to see you very soon.